Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for tuning in to another Risk Institute online session. Um, today, we're fortunate to have with us the wonderful Professor Ekaterina Oa, uh, who will talk to us about her research on assessing the likelihood of mutations in BRCA uh, 1 and 2 genes with Interval and dempster schafer theory-based uh, methods. The presentation will be around 45 minutes with around 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, please make sure that your mics are muted and if you'd like to leave any questions in the chat uh, for Professor uh, Aua, um, we'll uh, bring them up at the end of the, the presentation. So before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements. Um, so our next event will be the Risk Institute annual showcase um, on the 1st of February at 10 a.m. So uh, we've sent out an email announcement, but if you'd like to get the link for that, please do get in touch. Um, we also have Dominic Hose to give us a talk on the 15th of February at 2 a.m., uh, 2 p.m. even, um, followed by Professor Zafalon Marco talking to us about causal inference in imprecise probability in action on the 22nd of February at 2 p.m. And then we also have a talk about volcanoes, uh, the keys to the past, a mixed methods approach to reconstructing the 1812 eruption um, of La Soufrière uh, Saint Vincent. Um, by Dr. Jasmine Scarlett on the 24th of February at 2 p.m. So I'll keep you posted on those and provide links uh, via email in due course. So I'd like to present our speaker, um, Professor E. Katerina Aua is a professor of mathematics at the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Applied Sciences in Wismar, Germany, since 2015. She's received the diplomas in mathematics and computer science um, from Ulyanovsk uh, State University in Russia in 2001, and from the University of Dolzburg, Essen, Germany in 2002. She's worked at the Chair of Computer, Computer Graphics and Science of Computing um, at the University of Duisburg, Essen as a research assistant, receiving a PhD in 2007 and a postdoctoral qualification habilitation in 2014. Her main areas of interest are algorithms with result verification and the applications to engineering problems, so biomechanics or an energy system simulation, um, and she's also got some interest in uncertainty quantification and propagation using verified stochastic or mixed method approaches. Uh, there's another, the, the list goes on and on. She's got a lot of interest. <laughs> and uh, so I welcome our speaker. And um, if you'd like to start sharing your slides, then we can begin. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for this introduction. <laughs> so, okay, I will try to share my screen. Mm. So first I need to, to find the light. The green, the green button. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So thank you very much for this introduction. And I would like to thank you all for inviting me and giving me, me the opportunity to talk to you today. So, um, well, um, this is a joint work with my colleague, Professor Wolfram Luther from the University of Duisburg Essen. And actually, it was his idea to um, do something in this area. He got interested due to some personal reasons, and he got us interested in the topic. So, um, yeah, probably from the mathematical point of view, this is not really rocket science, but from the point of view of the healthcare, it's really tangled. And um, well, we actually enjoy working on this topic and tried, uh, trying to entangle all those things that are connected with this topic. So some background, we are going to talk about cancer in a well in the stock and cancer occurs because of mutation in cells. So um, mutations, um, the better term for this is now pathogenic variants. So that uh, we don't have the, the impression that the mutation occurs right now, but um, it can be pass also passed on, yeah. And um, this is um, also the reason for discerning between two types of mutations, somatic and germline. Somatic mutations account for almost all, almost all, uh, let's say almost all cancer cases. And um, are considered to be non-hereditary. 
because um, those mutations affect just um, tissues where the cells are in. But the germline mutations occur in reproductive cells, for example, in a, a sperm cell. And that's why they can be passed on for generations, and that's why this type of mutation is considered to be hereditary. Um, well, um, okay, those types of mutation account for only 5 to 10% of all of the cases. But if we know how uh, they work, then we can advise the whole families on uh, the so-called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome that we are going to talk about uh, here today. So, um, breast cancer is the second common type of cancer if we consider both sexes combined, and it's the first common type of cancer in the female population. In the 90s, it was discovered that um, the mutations in the so-called tumor suppressor genes BRCA1 and 2 are responsible for breast and ovarian cancer. So if you consider the risk of breast cancer in the general, the general female population, it's about, of 12, it's about 12%. But if you already carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, then the risk can increase up to 65% even. Additionally, the risk of ovarian cancer increases. And... Uh, well, this gave the idea that the mutation in those genes uh, leads to a heightened risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So, um, what can we do? Well, the genetic tests to obtain, uh, well, the result about um, if, you are, if you carry or don't carry a mutation can detect such mutations or variants, well, reliably, relatively reliably, let's say, but although it seems like the first step to take here, genetic testing, well, this is not how it is done. Why not? Well, on the one hand, we uh, have the situation that those tests are still very expensive. Well, in Germany, it um, costs of about a uh, thousand euro and uh, the healthcare uh, covers it only if you belong to a high risk class. Um, also, uh, the results of those genetic tests are not always helpful for everyone. Yes? So for example, we can only interpret uh, the results sometimes only 20% of the cases in the right way. So it's not always helpful even to have this. That's why uh, the usual procedure is uh, slightly different. So if you have a uh, suspicion that you have some inherited some mutations in certain genes, um, well, it is known that the gene change is more likely in a person with some family history of breast ovarian cancer. So that's why the doctors first take a look at your family history of cancer and maybe model the uh, mutation probability or your risk of cancer with uh, the help of some uh, risk assessment tools, mathematical models first. Then based on the results of this risk assessment, uh, you referred for the genetic counseling uh, where you discuss the pros and cons of genetic testing, um, genetic counseling helps patients and their families make informed decisions about disease prevention, personal mitigation, and therapy. So after this step, you are either referred um, uh, to your genetic uh, for genetic testing, or maybe maybe not. Maybe you don't need this. Maybe the genetic counseling is enough. So and. Um, you're um, again um, referred, um, well, the results of risk assessment are explained to you after that. 
So uh, what are the criteria that the doctors have here in the family history to decide about your risk? So for example, closeness of relations to the persons having mm -hmm. some cancer diagnosis, their number, the age of the affected family members, those are the uh, criteria that prediction tools base their decisions on. So, what are the key indicators of a hereditary risk? First, uh, for you personally, this would be cancer occurring at young age, rare cancers, more than one primary cancer or bilateral cancer. Wow, and actually all the same things also in your family history, yes? For example, for any relatives. Also, your ethnicity plays an important role. Um, it um, is a known fact that, for example, Ashkenazi Jewish population has a higher risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Yes, and uh, what predictor tools do? They can assess on the one hand chances of developing breast cancer over a given time span, including the lifetime, or chances of a mutation in a high risk gene. And this is the, the assessment that we will concentrate on in this talk. Yes, well, um, what about this prediction probabilities? Empirical studies and also models differ widely in their results. Yes. So for example, here I've shown you a table from this publication, relatively recent. And uh, we see here different studies that compute, for example, here this combined probability of RECA1 into mutation. So, and even if we only concentrate on high risk mutations, that is hereditary mutations or mix, uh, leaving out these sporadic or somatic mutations, then we can see that the results for this uh, mutation probability can range from well, approximately 5% probability to approximately 28% um, probability, depending on the study, depending on the race, depending on the country of origin, depending on the time. So um, this is one, one point. So what, what kind of a result is the right one? Um, where should we orient ourselves on? Um, on the other hand, uh, those studies also have a certain bias. They always choose patients at high risk usually. And also we don't know, according to this criteria, they define this word high risk. Yeah? So what is high risk for them? So we don't know. Sometimes we even don't know how they choose the patients for their uh, cohorts. So sometimes, for example, in this study, it is clearly explained which kinds of patients they are um, taking in, into considerations. So there are always a kind of bias in those studies. On the other hand, different studies use also different criteria, what I called previously as key indicators of hereditary risk. So if you want to compare the results of the studies, we need to work with some sets, you know, or something like imprecise probability to be able to compare them. So what is our goal? So our general goal is to make genetic counseling reliable. If we take a look at this picture again, so they have lots of verification and validation procedures at this step. So how can we verify and validate that the results of genetic testing are okay? But this step is not always carried out. Sometimes we just stop after the step of genetic counseling, yes? And here we don't know how reliable uh, those results are. And we need to know this because um, we need to have reliable results because they influence patients' uh, decisions directly. So we can imagine that it's 
not easy to do this, yes, to make this process reliable. But what can we begin with? Well, first, we need to define unified and consistent risk factors or criteria across different risk assessment tools and studies that I will show you in a moment. Then we might need to work with sets for representing epistemic uncertainty if these criteria do not map to each other in full. And then, of course, we will need to propagate this uncertainty through the models. But before all the steps can be made to begin with, we need to consider this step. And this is the most difficult one, actually. So we need to find the ground truth and calibrate different studies. I'm not sure that it is even possible. So, but at least we, we can do something in this direction. Uh, direction. So what is uh, today's program? I will tell you about the steps one and three, um, how to cover them using dempster shepherd theory and possibly intervals. And then I will show you a short outlook how to um, uh, well, find possibilities, solution possibilities for this, uh, for finding ground truth. So let me give you some examples of uh, mutation prediction tools that are available um, today. Yeah, so since, um, well, approximately a decade at least, and some are uh, longer there. So for example, this tool, um, uh, from the Pennsylvania University, the Pen2 risk model. Um, what do we have here? We have a kind of, well, this is ac ac accessible online. So you can um, compute this online, everything, yeah. So um, this is a kind of a questionnaire that has three parts. Um, first, um, well, we are asked which side of the family is being evaluated when we provide information, for example, on the criteria of ethnicity. Maybe also we have here um, uh, male breast cancer um, and other things, something that you recognize maybe from the slide about the key indicators. So um, actually three parts of this part is optional part. So we um, have only three parts. And after we filled out this questionnaire, then this and this um, window, we see uh, the results for, for example, for the family mutation probability here. Well, for me, it's zero. And um, for the BRCA1 mutation and, uh, well, approximately 1% for BRCA2 mutation. And if you want the combined possibility, then a good assessment for that will be to, to add those two numbers. Well, it is also possible to do this slightly differently. Um, these are two earlier, let's say, studies um, um, from the 90s, where um, they uh, compiled the probabilities in tables. So, uh, for example, Frank tables predict mutations for record one and two, which are correlated with the age of diagnosis, personal and family history and ethnicity. So they have such criteria here, yes, and they say, well, okay, then if all this um, uh, is there, then the probability is like that or like that, yes. So this is a method based on empirical st studies and logistic regression analysis with some of bigger problems, the groups in comparison to this study, which predicts the cumulative breast cancer probability also um, with, uh, as concerns the family history correlated with the family history, also a little bit more differentiated with respect to age. Here we just have less than 50 years of age, here we have 20 to 30 and so one years of age. Here also um, this principle is based on some empirical st studies plus the use of a Bayesian model but with a smaller problem groups. So both of those tools do not include non-hereditary factors. This, this is not something that we want to do in this talk. Well, a quite different tool is the so-called Ontario Family History Assessment Tool. 
So the goal of the tool is to develop criteria for who should be referred, uh, referred for genetic counseling and genetic testing, something that I call risk factors. Well, the approach is to select those who are at approximately twice the population risk of cancer. The basis is opinions of experts. Yes, and uh, this, this process was validated using cross tables. So we have some risk factors. These risk factors are assigned points. The points are sum, summed up, yes, for you. And if you have a score of more than 10, then you have a double uh, um, risk uh, to, uh, uh, to, to contract cancer over your lifetime as compared to the general population. So, and we see, for example, here, um, breast and ovarian cancer in mother, sibling, and uh, relatives uh, produces different um, amounts of points that we can get uh, for this criteria. So some of the other tools, they just consider breast and ovarian cancer in the same person without uh, differentiating between the relatives. That is, if we want to compare those other tools with this tool, we might want to work with a set of points. And I will show you in a minute how we can do this. Well, uh, another example from England, something from Manchester, Manchester scoring system, well, similar to the family history assessment tool, but uh, they obtain here or they predict BRCA1 or 2 mutation probability, yes? And also they differentiate between BRCA1 and BRCA2. And um, so we are also referred for genetic counseling if our score is more than 10. Also here we can uh, obtain sets for the scores. The most simple tool is the so-called referring screening tool. So we have such kind of a questionnaire and uh, need to check uh, what is um, right for us. And if we have more than two checks in the table, then we have high risk. Well, if not, then not. And uh, this is also based on a, a contemporary um, mathematical models for prediction. Uh, of uh, mutations, prob mutation probability. So we see um, also different kind of questions. For example, uh, they correspond to the criteria. This criteria, more than two cases of breast cancer after age 15, uh, 50, sorry, we did not see this kind of criteria in any tool. So you can imagine that it's difficult to find the set of a unified criteria which would uh, unify this procedure a little bit. So what can be done? Or well, how can we, for example, go from probabilities to scores? Um, well, this is just an example of how this can be done for um, frank tables. Here's a, a table from the original publication and the family history assessment tool that I've shown you earlier. So, for example, we can orient ourselves on frank tables. Um, they have different kinds of criteria, which I've written down here. Um, and we will only take a look at the first one to understand how we can compute the corresponding criteria, a uh, corresponding score for the um, F hat system. So um, we have here the um, criteria, a uh, criterion of any relative with breast cancer less than 50 years of age. That is, if we talk, take a look at the risk factors from HAT, then we will only need those two, one combined, to reflect this criterion. So that means, well, those intervals, I've shown you how we computed them on the previous slide where I talked about this uh, family history assessment tool. So to reflect this criterion, we need to add those two intervals and obtain for only female breast cancer this kind of heart score. score. Yes, yeah, so if I have um, this score, then I know that my mutation probability is somewhere in this area. 
Yes, so we see we have different opinions from different kind of tools. And when we yeah, want to merge them, then the first thing that we uh, think on or think about is, of course, the dumpster Schaeffer um, theory. Yes, so um, and now I will, would like to show you how we can merge such expert opinions based, for example, on Frank tables, Frank tables from this publication. So I will show you the table here. So this is how this Frank table typically looks like for the um, non-Jewish population. And uh, you see here, uh, we have two sides. For example, this side is like the family history side. And we have also this view, let's say. This is the personal or individual view for you as a patient. So we have several sets of probabilities for that. Yes, and inspired by these probabilities, we can uh, define a probability assignment, one for this view, one for this view, and combine them. Of course, first, we need to define the criteria according to which we want to, uh, uh, well, build our um, dempster Schaeffer model. Well, those crit criteria are written down here. This is first breast cancer over 50 years of age, breast cancer under 50 years of age, ovarian uh, cancer at any age, um, less than 50 years of age. This is, uh, those are two additive factors for less than 40 years of age. Cancer in the near relative, bilateral, uh, male cancer, and then some combinations of those factors that seems, seem to be important, uh, not only in those frank tables where they are maybe um, not mentioned at all, but for example, in such tools as um, Ontario, Ontario family assessment, um, history assessment tool, and so on. So those are two mass probability assignments obtained out of the personal view and out of the family history view. So for example, if we take a look at that number, while well, we can go back and see this is um, breast cancer over out of the personal history over 50 years of age, no cancer in anyone else. So it's approximately 2%. Well, I'm not um, explaining about how this data comes along and why we did not take 2.3% uh, exactly, yes. I, I already told you that the ground truth is really difficult to obtain. So this is just kind of a proof of concept. All right, so um, so this is um, how we can, uh, can work with that. And if you want this number, so this is approximately this number, which is shown here and so on and so forth. Okay, after we identified all these masses, we can combine those two views in one um, mass assignment using Dempster's rule combination. And after that, we can compute the lower bound on the probability of a mutation um, by using the usual uh, definition of a belief function. And so, for example, like here, and in this column, I've shown the corresponding probabilities from the Frank table we are available. And we see they are quite, you know, well, not, not exactly the same, but quite similar. Although we base them on slightly different data and slightly different, oh, not slightly, different, completely different modeling. So I have here in the table two parts. One part is for the non 
Ashkenazi population, uh, sorry if this was wrong, um, <clears throat> non-Ashkenazi population, and this part is for the Ashkenazi population. Yeah, what can we do with that? So let's consider an example for non-Ashkenazi. We have, um, for example, a patient uh, which, who is diagnosed with ovarian and breast cancer at this age um, and her mother having bilateral breast cancer at over 50 years of age. Yeah? So the low estimation of the mutation likelihood could, can be computed then as a belief function over the following set of arguments. Well, um, first we need uh, the breast cancer and the sedative factor because of less than 50 years of age, of, of course, here 22. Yeah, then we have ovarian cancer at any age with a corresponding additive factor for less than 40. Then we have uh, uh, breast cancer mm, at the age of over 50 years for the mother near relative and bilateral factor. If you just compute the belief function, we will get this probability of approximately 53%. Um, and if we just use the PAM2 model, which is based on quite different data and use quite different model, we have a really similar probability of 54%. Well, note that PAN2 knows exactly about this information. So PAN2 takes into account exactly the age of um, at the diagnosis, yes, the age um, of the patient. All right, so how can we reflect this? So we just used um, less than 50, the corresponding, uh, sorry, less than 40, the corresponding probability, but not the exact age. So we can reflect this by assigning an interval to the corresponding mass, yes? And um, we can obtain an interval then for, um, for the um, belief in that. But this would mean that we will work with uh, dempster sheffer theory using intervals. And this is somewhat uh, difficult um, out of, uh, from my point of view, because then the whole probability um, does not sum up to one exactly, but encloses one only. All right, if we use the same example for the Ashkenazi Jewish population, then the, the um, probability will be very, very high. So that's why I just um, changed in the example a little bit. So we have now um, uh, the problem at the age of 35 with um, breast and wearing cancer. And now we consider her own, uh, which um, uh, who should have the bilateral breast cancer at over 50 years of age. Um, using the same principles, we can obtain this kind of um, this kind of a lower estimation for the likelihood of the mutation, also with intervals, also corresponding uh, approximately to the um, family risk from the pen tool model. That is, this uh, dempster sheffer model I've shown you corresponds uh, quite well to this model, although it, they are based on different data and also on slightly, well, not slightly, but quite different criteria how to determine uh, the mutation, the likelihood of the mutation. So what do we learn from this model? Um, well, on the other hand, we see that it is quite good if we are able to discern more finely with respect to the age of onset. And if we read some other literature, we see that there are important factors such as the presence of triple negative breast cancer uh, that are also that also influence um, the probability. For example, take a look at this picture from this publication. So we see here, for example, the probabilities 
um, depending on age for mutations for people having breast cancer and for people having triple negative breast cancer. And so we see along from the scale that this triple negative um, probabilities are much higher. Yes, and well, and in some respects, and also here we can see them um, in some ages, um, then are the corresponding general probabilities. So those factors are absent uh, from frank tables. So that's why, yeah, we can try to do something else, um, a different model, a different possibility that we can have here. Of course, it is quite similar. We also have um, kind of um, um, factors that we try to incorporate in our model, for example, breast cancer, depending on age, bilateral breast cancer, depending on age, male cancer, triple negative, ovarian, um, breast and ovarian, and the same person, breast and ovarian, and the family history. Yes, and depending on that, we can also um, give uh, um, an assessment of the mutation probability. Let me show you how this can be done. Um, this is the same example as previously for the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So this information about the age um, is actually quite useful. For example, here is the corresponding curve, cumulative curve for the um, breast and ovarian cancer in the same person. So I can take a look at what kind of probability I would have according to this curve at 35 years of age. This is equal to 39%. Um, so for the hunt, I only have uh, the probability over, uh, well, the age over 50 years of age. That's why I will get an interval according to this curve of bilateral cancer. Uh, um, and this is a score, uh, well, the, the percentage between 11 and 14%. So that we have an interval at the end um, also uh, quite close to the probability from the pen mode. All right, so I already told you, don't ask me about how to get this uh, data. Yes, because it's really difficult. And of course, um, how can we get to the ground truth? The easiest way would be to cooperate with some clinics, some medical research scientists that have already have some databases, yes? But uh, the problem is always, well, how biased those uh, databases are. Yeah, for example, we can have um, databases in Germany or in Japan that register cancer in the population depending on different parameters, such as gender, age. This is exactly what we need to do. Or typify cancer and treatment methods. All of those databases are not public. Yeah, so we need to some kind of a cooperation. And also they are quite biased and not, uh, well, cannot be used together at the moment, yeah, all together. So what is accessible online are, for example, uh, such databases that classify pathogenic variants of various uh, irrelevance, yes. So this is something you can access online and those databases or some of them, for example, this one even has, um, well, uh, fields for recording family history and everything, but they are empty because uh, the researchers that use those databases, they are only interested in classification. Yeah, so um, classification does not give us any information about family history percentages and so on and so forth. So where we can get information like I've done in this talk is from papers, yes, from papers. Um, and those papers are, for example, available at this uh, public database, PubMed, or such publications. But the problem is, it is really difficult to automatize somehow the extraction of information from these papers because um, 
of different criteria that uh, the researchers use of different choice of cohorts that this um, 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 researchers use. Thus, else it is not possible without collaboration to extract the data from publications automatically, not without collaboration. So this is really difficult. And um, well, a student um, of mine have found a kind of a possibility um, online how we can work with something like that. This is a good database, genomic data commons. Um, it allows researchers to search and download cancer data, not just breast cancer, but any kind of cancer. And they are uh, the fields uh, cases with family histories and exposures uh, contain, actually contain information. And uh, those um, data fields also have detailed genetic information. So how can we proceed here? It is possible to, well, put a kind of query we are interested in here on this, into this database, for example, breast cancer less than 50 years of age. So we have the cases which are then linked to the uh, database containing the pathogenic variants, for example, this database, BRCA exchange, after which we can have descriptions and uh, the corresponding probabilities, but this is just an outlook and uh, we just, yes, would like to try this way to get the ground truth information about the probability. So let me come to the conclusions. What are the results? So I think at least in the second variant, we were able to identify important risk factors. We propose to modeling possibilities are uh, taken into account epistemic uncertainty, also uh, the epistemic uncertainty, of course, also we are later with both of them uh, together. So this helped us to represent and in a way to propagate bounded uncertainty in the data. So what is necessary? Well, without the standardized data with a focus on the test participant numbers and age and origin, it is not possible to have a really, uh, you know, founded ground truth information. What is also necessary um, is collaboration. Uh, it is only possible to merge recommendations of the expert into proposal after the data is collaborated. And of course, uh, which, well, uh, something that is not considered so far or where the doctors only start to consider that as the consequences of risk assessment and post-test counseling, so um, this is also a hot topic at the moment, and it's uh, really difficult to assess anything here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm now um, ready for questions. Thank you very much, Professor Awa, uh, for a really wonderful presentation. Cutting edge work, really, really fascinating and important. Um, does anyone have any questions from the audience? I see that. Adolphus has his hand raised. Would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you so much, Francis. And uh, good afternoon, Professor Orr. Um, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, just have two questions, um, but we'll go through them one by one. Um, the first one is just mainly a um, just an inquiry. Perhaps I missed like earlier the present uh, the presentation, but uh, just for you, just to clarify, for you, how do we actually do the calibration of these uh, like uh, medical data that we are talking about here? Yes, yes, this is a big question. This is something I I was giving here on to, uh, under the point necessary. Yeah, so this is really necessary to do this calibration and it's not really clear how to do this. Yes. So in our work, we didn't need to calibrate that because we considered um, information from one source only. Mm. Yeah. So but uh, 
yes, it is necessary to do this if you consider multiple sources. Right. So as of now, it's not really a fixed mm, procedure. Well, we have some approaches, yes, okay. to calibrate this, but um, yeah, that's maybe I'm not ready to present it just uh. now, you know, because it's it's not easy. It's it's um, maybe you will come up with a nice idea here. Yes. Yeah? So until now, we, we can calibrate, but it's it's not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so. I understand. Yeah. Okay. No, no worries. Yeah, okay. Um, which brings me to my second question. So um, just wondering, you know, uh, have you considered doing, uh, because I, I see you've presented this uh, Debs Schefter based model and you've uh, from there actually obtained the uncertainty. Have we actually thought of like, like you know, uh, doing incorporating online learning as well? Because as you know, the uh, all these patient data and their the, the uh, profiles would, would change over time. And one of the most important thing is for real time updating of these uncertainties and and the the bounds on on, on you know, some of the things that you're trying to infer. Have we considered uh, this aspect of online learning into this model as well? Um, not yet. Um, um, I forgot to tell you at uh, the beginning of the talk. This is just uh, this is a topic we're just starting to work on. Yes. Uh, and um, the problem is here that. Um, of course, it would be it would be fantastic if we could if we can do something like that. But at the moment, we don't even have access to this point of standardized data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't have access to data in this kind of um, way that we can have information on probabilities. Um, that interest us, yeah? So we need to do this manually by reading papers and considering this and by calibrating manually and everything. So, you know, um, this is the problem. You don't have uh, a lot of data for that and you don't have a data um, that updates itself, you know? Mm. So that's why it is at the moment, um, I think uh, at the moment, for, for now, 2022, it is safe to say that um, we don't have any databases capable of doing something like that. They are not updated publicly, um, you know, I don't know, yearly or monthly with new mm -hmm. data. So all the data is static at the moment. That's why um, it is a very interesting thing to do something like that. Mm -hmm. But the data does not allow it at the moment. No worries. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot, a lot of work, especially now that it's only in the it is beginning, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's nice to see how this would progress in, in the future sometime soon. Mm -hmm. But uh, once again, thank you so much for your insight and your discussion on this topic. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, because I find the, the idea of standardizing the data um, really, really challenging. I've come across it in my own work using Dempster shape theory in indoor agriculture. It's quite an emerging sector and the, the data is collected in different ways. Do you have any guidelines for how you might standardize the data? I know you said it's still the kind of early stages of the project, but do you have like a wish list of kind of how the data might be collected or, or things that might help you um, calibrate it more easily? Um, yes, so we have a um, kind of a wish list, but it's not um, at the moment um, in the form that we can formulate them really. Right. really. This is something that, um, you know, it goes to this question of, uh, let me uh, show you. Can, oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to show this here. There goes oh, to yes. the question of uh, how to make this reliable, yes, and how to perform this verification and validation assessment that is um, um, 
you know, ubiquitous um, everywhere in other areas in engineering and even for genetic testing, it is uh, in place, you know, but, but not for genetic counseling. Yes. And also, okay, those are all those mathematical models and so on, they are validated somehow, but still you don't know how to incorporate them into this genetic counseling process right. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yes, of course. So, for example, um, one way of uh, generalizing or uh, one way to formulate this uh, wish list is to take a look at those uh, criteria here, key indicators. Yeah. So we need information, uh, differentiated information on on all of those key indicators. I mentioned also uh, later on in my talk, such as origin, uh, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So many of the data are not standardized in this way. Yeah, so we, um, unfortunately, we are not in a position to say, so we want to have a data in this and this way. Yeah, so nobody listens. Yeah, <laughs> so because no, I'm sure, I'm sure. They have their of databases. Course. And they are not bad, actually, but um, if you take a look at databases that are available online, you will see that they already have the necessary fields that would interest us a lot, but what they don't have is the information in them. So the database contains the necessary fields, but not the information. Right. The metadata, okay. metadata is okay, but not 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 fuel, you know, not the actual data. Mm. Yeah. So and yeah, how to standardize it? So from our point of view, those criteria, you know, they mentioned here. Uh, here, yeah, so we need the information about them. Uh, here, those ones with age also in this kind of of way. And also what we need to is uh, the criteria for um, of how the initial cohorts were, were composed, yeah, so that we understand um, what kind of risk class is considered initially, yeah, so maybe it is already elevated or even high, yeah, so that's why if you take patients that have high risk from the start, it is not a wonder that you have um, then a very high probability of, of, of a mutation. So we need to take that into account if you want to calibrate anything. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for a really comprehensive answer. That's uh, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I believe Scott had his hand raised before. Did you want to ask a question, Scott? No, I was just applauding. I, I got here late, so I, I'll have to go back to the video to hear it in context, I think. But it's very exciting, of course. And yeah, the, absolutely. The, I, I wish uh, Alex had been here because this, uh, it should change. He's right, it's straight. Right, it should change his dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> He's almost well, done, I'm, here, right? I guess. I'm not sure I'll tell him about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I th Sorry, Adolphus. Oh, no, nothing, because I was just asking if he's about to graduate soon, right, I guess. <laughs> dissertation yeah. writing. Yeah, I think you would have really loved this talk, actually. I'll definitely make sure to, to send it on to them. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? No? Okay. Well, let's wrap up then. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Thanks Awa, for your talk. Fun, really, really intriguing. I'm really excited about the work that you put out. So we'll make sure to, to stay updated. And um, hopefully we'll be able to meet you post pandemic in person uh, one day as well, and maybe be able to invite you to the Institute. <laughs> Thanks, <So>. same <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. See you later. Thank you so bye. much, Professor. Thank you, bye-bye.